Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to this new meeting of Evolution Society of Pathology and Transplantation, CMPE, in our usual date, Wednesday 9 p.m. Welcome, everyone. Today, we have two great professors, well known in the field of hemodialysis uh, from Ayn Shams University. Uh, our moderator today is Professor Magdi Sherawi, Professor of Pathology and Internal Medicine at Shams University. Uh, one of the Afrian committees for uh, dialysis. He is uh, also the leading of uh, NCHAMP's uh, annual conference up to its 13th uh, cycle now, uh, which is one of the well-known international and national and Arabic conferences in the fields of dialysis and, and uh, nephrology. Uh, Professor Magdi is our moderator today and we need the session which will be uh, by Professor Hisham Sayed, who is the, the man of hemodialysis in Egypt and Africa, and one of the landmarks of dialysis worldwide. Uh, he will uh, speak about uremic toxins and how to deal with regarding uh, hemodialysis modalities. Uh, Professor Hisham is the vice president of Egyptian Society of Pathology. And I will leave uh, Professor Magdi now to introduce more and more Professor Hisham and introduce, give a hint about this important topic and Professor Hisham to speak about. Please, Professor Magdi. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, evening meeting. I'd like first to thank Professor Yasser uh, for her persistence and his uh, uh, effort to keep this uh, uh, educational uh, CME is uh, alive. Uh, it's my honor to introduce my brother and my friend, uh, Professor Hisham Said. I think no one in the Middle East, uh, uh, no one in Egypt, no one in Africa doesn't know who is Hisham Said. He is one of the uh, figures, illuminating figures is in, in, in dialysis and in hemodialysis research and hemodialysis technology. And I think uh, uh, even worldwide, he's well recognized for his publication in the field of hemodialysis. Uh, today, Professor Hisham uh, will talk about a very important topic. Uh, and uh, this topic is, is keeping changing. Every few years, it's changing. And uh, our understanding of uremic toxins is changing and uh, uh, it will, it will change the way we deal with this uremic toxin as we will see in the presentation. Uh, without further delay, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Hisham to start his uh, interesting topic, uremic toxins, updates, and uh, uh, management uh, and in, in the modalities of hemodialysis. Professor Hisham, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Wishing you a very uh, good evening, a warm evening, actually, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Yasser, my colleagues and my friend, and uh, Professor Dr. Magdishar Awi, my colleague and friend, and uh, uh, good evening all uh, for this talk. I will highlight uh, today some of the important new issues in the, uh, our understanding of the uremic toxin and the modality of uh, therapy, what's new and how we can approach on that. So i keep you updated on that, and we will start by the uh, agenda today uh, talk about what's new in uramic toxins classifications and examples of uh, some of the uramic toxicity what's new in home dialysis which is an emerging opportunity for patients on dialysis and the, the outcome not only on the era of COVID, but on the era of mortality uh, especially the nocturnal dialysis and uh, finally we will have uh, a hemodial filtration new researches and the publications in Enchamps University and uh, also on the worldwide. So uh, going to the Aramic toxin from Van Holder, who saying that Utox and a, a variety of Aramic toxins have been identified. Although the number of Aramic toxins identified in the early of 2000s is around 100, but it's still building up more and more of the Aramic toxins. So in the classic taxonomy, uremic retention compounds are divided into three 
main categories. This is a thesis. A small solid with a very small solid, less than 500 Dalton, and the middle molecules, which expanded to more than up to 15,000, and protein pound uramic toxins. However, protein pound uramic toxins coming from very small solids, unfortunately, it's bound to Alton. So we're having a significant kinetic differences. So it is not the molecular weight or uh, the toxicity, the significant kinetics differences which affect the modality of therapy. If you have a two or three kinetic modeling poles, we will have a difficult removal or need more attention on dialysis. Pocurea and creatinine are the surrogates of that, the godfather of uremic. Uh, um, uh, biomarkers. However, still their toxicity is still undefined. And finally, the renewed interest in the potential toxic effect of inorganic compounds, including sodium, potassium, water, hydrogen, iron, phosphate, calcium, along with the treatment-related determinants of their removal. So the classic one of the small solid water-soluble compounds and the molecular weight with the prototype is urea, is around 60 up to 500. And the protein pound compounds mostly are small molecules, but attached to proteins. The prototype like indoxyl sulfate and the middle molecules more than 500 Dalton and the prototype is the beta 2 microglobin. Uremic toxin, what are they? An integrated overview of pathobiology with a connection between the toxic substance and one or more of the pathobiological or clinical features of the uremic syndrome must be firmly demonstrated. So it is a changing the panoramic view of the uremic toxins from just the retention molecules. Now we can do a pathobiological correlation between a retention molecule and its effect. Subsequently, recently, the uramic toxins have been classified into more five types or even six types. However, the main four types are type one with an accumulation in the body fluid of toxic substances normally produced endogenously by metabolic process, largely as a result of reduced renal secretory capacity like urea. While type two, it is an excess endogenous production or impaired degradation or both, but not because of reduced renal excretory capacity, exactly like parathyroid hormone. And type three involves the accumulation of toxic substance in the biological fluids from exogenous sources by virtue of reduced renal excretory capacity. Example, drugs overdosing toxins, which could be removed by the kidney, but failing kidney cannot. And type four, which is the last one, is a deficiency or reduced activity of substances normally produced endogenously as a result of decreased synthesis, enhanced degradation, or biological inhibition. Open the door for all the metabolomics effect of uremia with associated accumulations of many of metabolites. The unsolved problem is the large middle molecules in inflammation and the cardiovascular diseases. Now it's finally, we all know that the cardiovascular diseases and the plaque rupture and thromboses is related to many of the aromatic toxins. Example, the cytokines, interleukins, tumor necrosis factors, as well advanced glycation in the products, adhesion molecules and others. So many players in the uramic toxin milieu can induce one organ damage or multiple organ damage. The debate on the protein pound uramic toxin is still present because we are leaking that the gut microbiota is responsible for the production of the protein pound uramic toxin. For example, the big crystal coming from tryptophan. And this is the uramic toxin has multi phases in the toxicity, mainly in the cardiovascular as well in the progression of chronic kidney disease. So, retention of such molecules in the era of chronic kidney disease 
will increase the progression to end the stage kidney disease, giving an open door for the treatment of microbiota, changing the, the media and the field in the gut. So the middle molecules in the range of 15,000 to 60,000 that have evidence for involvement in inflammation and cardiovascular disease now becoming a very recognized uremic toxin far away from the small solids like urea or keratin. And this is very big example. If you can see that the molecular size and their biological rule, you can find that the molecular weight in kilo dalton extending, approaching up to 50,000. Most of them are modulating either the pro-inflammatory cytokines or promote endothelial cell proliferations, angiogenesis, phosphate homostasis, or components of alternative component complement pathways. So it is a multi-organic compound that moderates and uh, manipulates the whole body, not only the heart, the brain, the gut, the neuro neurological as well either. And if you put that on the right panel, you can find that how many falls are higher in patients with chronic kidney disease. Still, we know that there is a lot of unknown in the uremia. So what has been identified is still far away from the metabolic error and the retention of molecules in patients with chronic kidney disease. So the classification of chronic toxins and their rule in kidney failure, recommendation for the update and the classification, beyond the physiochemical characteristics, we have to do their linkage to clinical symptoms and outcomes, and how the dialectic removal pattern of uremic retention solutes. So the physiochemical classification, the old one, is unsatisfactory, not adequately addressed or reflect how current modern hemodialysis technology, like absorption, convection, and diffusion remove toxins. And the classification on the basis of its nature, toxicity to the organs, that unmet diuremic toxin does not adequately reflect the biologic consequences of the toxin. And finally, the classification on the basis of patient's outcome, morbidity, mo mortality, complications, as it still should be identified. So this is, I think this is one of the uh, fine graphs if you put that in the current classification from Van Holders of the UTOX, when defining the molecular weight alone and the terminology limitation that, that clinically identified and the biologically flows are uh, uh, prod, overly prod and non-specific and has suggested update that the solute identification and the quantification analysis in the blood should be possible for the plasma, giving the chance of new biomarkers, not only from the pace of the chronic kidney D assessment, but as well for the dialysis adequacy and negatively affect conforming with contributing to biological or clinical changes. So what's in you in your toxins coming from the laboratory as well research from identifying retention solids, we have to identify carefully which solids have been identified and its correlation to the disease. Subsequently, we can find a way to remove. Another example here, if you have a uremic toxin on the left panel, can even damage the kidney, meaning that patients with chronic kidney disease, we all know that some of them have higher progression to chronic kidney disease in the stage kidney disease, and some of them are slower in progression. It's a multifactorial, we understand, controlling of the metabolic error, diabetes, hypertension, hyperuricemia, fluid balance, uh, nephrotoxicity, uh, and et cetera. But even uremic toxin itself can do more damage and more TKD progression. 
When you find that to a hematological immune system, endocrine, cardiovascular, neurological, and even nutrition and the muscle. So the biochemical and clinical impact of organic retention solids is this very comprehensive literature defining that. In this new literature, meaning that maybe one toxin can induce multiple organ damage and multiple toxins can induce single organ damage. For example, if you can uh, say cerebrovascular, we have one toxin or two toxins or three toxins affecting the neuropathy as well for the cardiovascular. So it's a correlation between either one toxin can induce multiple damage or group of toxins can induce single organ damage. According to the number of affected system in experimental studies, the highest rank of uremic toxin that induce organ damage is both the protein pound and the middle molecule. So keeping in mind that we still are defining that KT over V is a dialysis adequate. I'm against that at all. Because the rank of the toxicity of uremic toxins in the literature is very low regarding the small solids. So we have to define a new way of dialysis, prescription, monitoring, as well adequacy. So the highest toxicity evidence score coming from beta-2 microglobin, sites, sulfate, asymmetric dimethyl as, uh, sulfate, as well some of the advanced glycation in the product cytokine endocelin as well. So we will come to later some example of their toxicity of this example of the middle molecule. <coughs> so the recommendation meaning that the group suggested that PACO physiological effect of each uremic toxins like inflammation, cardiovascular and solid origin, intestinal generation should be stated wherever available and they're suggesting focusing on a limited number of key body system effects that are most prominent in uremia, such as cardiovascular damage, susceptibility to infection, neurological as patho physiological classification. So the new classification scheme must link uremic solids to traditional clinical outcomes and quality of life measures. We, are, we usually miss the quality of life in patients with dialysis, including pruritus, less leg syndrome, and the recovery time after dialysis. The three steps approach for a better hemodialysis outcome is identification of uremic toxins, representative biomarkers for different classes of uremic retention cells, correlation of such uremic toxins to clinical symptoms and outcomes, and finally, how to facilitate the personalized and to target dialysis prescription to improve quality of life, morbidity, and the mortality. Treatment to prevent the damage from uremic toxin, more effective removal of uremic toxin by dialysis, as protein pound uremic toxin cannot be eliminated using current dialysis strategy. It's very big, more than any of the dialysis temperance. Or we can use pharmacological agents to interfere with the production absorption of the coolant driving solids. The impact of uremic toxins on cerebrovascular and cognitive disorders toxins coming from the vascular dysfunction and its action on the brain structure. For the vascular dysfunction, endothelium, all of you find endothelial damage anywhere in any organs, atherosclerosis, hypercoagulability, vascular calcification, risk of thrombosis, hypertension. So all of them are equally in many organs. And the actions on brain structure itself by infiltration of monocytes, endothelial dysfunction, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, or oxidative stress. When looking to the heart and the carpal pulmonary uh, risk, you can find also Many of the uremic toxins can induce cardiomyopathy, ischemia, hypertrophy, 
This may be due to volume fluctuations or electrical dysfunction, electrolyte shift, or direct effect from a specific uremic toxin. The scheme of uremic toxins affecting different regulatory steps of cardiovascular calcification. Either we have minerals abnormality or inflammatory cascades, oxidative stress, and transcription factor with increasing osteochondritic differentiation genes. Apoptosis, senescence of cells, premature aging, and finally, you can find mineralization of the endothelial cells. So uremic toxins, an alarming danger concerning the cardiovascular system, including the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, adhesion molecules, prothrombotic factors, increasing impermeability, all of that affecting the inner layer of an endothelium with transforming of the muscular smooth muscle cells of the vessels, performing that and transferring that to bone forming cells and finally calcification and death. So the crosstalk between heart and the kidney contribution of uremic toxins, either from the metabolic errors, inflammatory errors, increasing in the hypertrophic profibrotic uh, 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 tension, uh, uh, tensions on that, including all of that in one kind of aggressive behavior inducing cardiac injury. The problem nowadays is no way to remove the protein pound uramic toxin. And subsequently, dialysis is not efficient. If you look to the protein pound uramic toxins, and example of that, the endoxal sulfate mediated cardiac syndrome, it's an organ fibrosis to the kidney with progression of CKD and to the heart as well with heart failure. So increasing endoxal sulfate giving a, a, a key point how we can change the nature of the colon to decrease the production rather than increasing the clearance by failure kidney. So this is a mechanism of that and the finally increased renal and the cardiovascular events from multiple steps, voodoo sites, changes, reduced cloth or expression, inflammation, gene expression, and in finally atherosclerosis and fibrosis. Traditional risk factor as well, if the inpatient with diabetes and long-standing hypertension, when going to end-stage kidney disease, the problem is magnifying and increasing the probability of death from the cardiovascular disorders. We have been published, me with Professor Dr. Magdi and my colleagues, that endotoxins retention in patients on dialysis, meaning that has a very high probability of cardiovascular disorders. And this endotoxemia carried a risk for cardiovascular disease with high specific C reactive protein positively correlated with endotoxemia and atrial fibrillation. And the endotoxin coming from the gut and related as well to uremic toxins with inflammation. It's well known that human necrosis factors facilitate endotoxin transfer. And this endotoxin transfer, either from in between cells due to impaired by junction or intracellular transfer, subsequently there is endotoxemia from the gut leak. So toxicity, retention molecules, accurate classification is difficult. Their potential toxicity re remains to be proven with their chemical structure and composition giving the light to a novel approach is needed to identify and explain their disease correlation. How to decrease the concentration, prevent accumulation of uremic toxins? Dialysis is the last step. We can change that by dietary modification, reducing generation in the gut. Importantly, preservation of the residual kidney function, even if it's five 
estimate G5, 5 millimeters per minute. It's good to remove the protein bound toxin. Additional environmental factors affecting uremic toxins. Example of that, that's say, phosphate alone is not toxic as much as it's associated with other comorbid conditions like hypercalcemia, deficiency of clotho, inflammation, changing the mono to diphosphate, acidosis has the same. So inflammation and acidosis, deficiency of clotho makes phosphate more toxic. The isometric dimethyl arginine, one of the very famous uramic toxins because it has a very potent inhibitor of nitric oxide sensitase. Subsequently, lower nitric oxide in the vessel, meaning that more platelet aggregation, less vasodilatation, smooth muscle cell proliferation, monocyte adhesions, and else. So this is one of examples of how a one toxin can induce vascular injury. The second example is the beta-2 microglobin. Interestingly, beta-2 microglobin in pre-dialysis level does not changes too much between low flux and high flux. However, while patients with retained beta-2 microglobin on low flux dialysis has higher percent of more deposition in the joints. It is simply that high flux meaning not only removing beta-2 microglobin, but removing additional cytokines that ag aggravate the beta-2 microglobin changing their structure and changing the microenvironment modification, glycation, and so all of them promote inflammatory osteolysis. Another example of ceramic toxin is trimethylamine oxide. It's known that it can induce thrombosis, atherosclerosis, stroke, myocardial infarction. And one of the recent considered very toxic ceramic solids is the free light chain. And we have to prospect that free light chain should be removed during our dialysis strategy. Free light chain either can induce light chain deposition disease, but mostly it's retained in patient with the uremia due to the lower excretion. Subsequently, free light chain even in patients not in uh, myeloma, for example, or plasma dyskinesis, has a very pro-inflammatory casket with increasing the platelet-derived growth factors, increasing all of that, making the organs are subjected to more toxicity. So there is association between immunoglobin free light chains with mortality. Among end-stage renal disease, if even in non-dialysis dependent, stages three to five CKD, if you have a free life chain higher in patient, the mortality is high. And this gives us a good biomarker for the progression and inflammation of patients, not even on dialysis, not only in patients in myeloma. FTG acid 23, we all know that fibroblast growth factor 23, is a food fatalic hormone, mostly secreted by osteocyte and osteoplast, indirectly by reducing calcium fuel level, also inhibits the secretion of parathyroid hormone. Accumulation of FPG at 32, an increased production to counteract the phosphate accumulation to overcome the resistance, the expression of the clotho, fibroblast growth factor clotho, and decrease renal clearance with degradation of fibroblast growth factor. Fibroblast growth factor, what comes in the bone, comes into flesh. So it's coming from the bone and induce cardiovascular events, left ventricular hypertrophy, and the vascular calcification. How to diagnose uronic toxin? One of the new era is the omics. And the omics, especially the proteomics, identifies that. Uremic toxin has been expanded to include proteins up to 55 to 60 kilodalt approaching the albumin. So 
how we are doing dialysis for patients, ensuring removing that very bigger molecular weight toxins, still we need more. And most of that, of the proteomic analysis are from the protein bound toxins and the middle molecule in the range from 15,000 to 60,000. So currently under in, uh, identification in, in omics, biomarkers, cardiovascular events, mortality, CKD, MBD, and the other new biomarkers should be identified. This is my first part, an overview of the uramic toxin. How hemodialysis strategy to ensure removal of uramic toxin? It's still, we have the players, the high flux, hemodial filtration, and expanded hemodialysis. What's wrong with conventional hemodialysis? It's our question. It's non-physiological, short duration, intermittency, protein pound uramic toxin not removed. Most toxins have multi-compartmental distribution with high rebound, shortly decreased after dialysis and rebound on the evening. And a high flux membrane are not equal in sieving coefficient. So you have high flux, but not effective as others. One of the emergent opportunity for dialysis is the home dialysis. And home dialysis has been looking for many of years to improve the quality of life. And most hemodialysis patients have significant unpleasant symptoms during treatment and take hours to recover. However, home dialysis is more flexible and improving the symptoms, improving the post dialysis fatigue, and improving as well the repound by more overnight home dialysis. The home dialysis either to use a basic dialysis machine or a compact one. You can, it's the uh, next stage, is the very commonest one, is the next stage you will see. And you can use either in center nocturnal dialysis or home nocturnal dialysis, more frequent dialysis five times per week or more prolonged dialysis, six to eight hours per day in the intermittent way. The extended time nocturnal hemodialysis target of cardiovascular benefits can improve the sleep apnea, coronary calcification, endocellular function, progenitor cells, improving the carpomylated album myocardial stunning. So varying association of that with quality of life has been shown that with more prolonged dialysis, more especially for patients with nocturnal dialysis, has higher rank of quality and the physical uh, life. You can use a home dialysis, either pattern hole versus speed letter. Pattern hole is the salt cannulation, can be used at home meaning that injection at the same site of injection by the needle or steep ladder. However, the study shows that more painful is the steep ladder for home dialysis. Patronol seems to be more convenient to patients at home dialysis. The water treatment of home dialysis must include the basics of it in center dialysis, but in a compact way. We have softener, carbon filter, RO, and endotoxin filter installed. It is the same way, way of the in center, but should be more compact. How to prescribe patient in center dialysis? It depends on the patient's requirement. Either five days per week, or every other day. I think every other day is uh, more convenient. What's the difference between every other day and five, five per week? Every other day, meaning that we don't have a long days in between the hours. For example, Saturday, 
Monday, Wednesday, not to wait to Saturday. Do this session on Friday. So every other day, irrespective of the days of the week. This more convenient way for patients as well to enjoy free dialysis uh, days. The candidates for home hemodialysis should be physically and mentally good, should be motivated and willing to learn the technique, should wish to continue to work or continue schooling, who have failed peritoneal dialysis and wish to continue therapy at home, and women who are pregnant or planning to conceive. Patients with the following medical conditions can improve sleep apnea, syndrome, persistent hyperphosphatemia, heart failure, refractory volume overload, difficult to control hypertension, or symptomatic hypertension cramps or nausea on conventional short session of dialysis, inadequate control of urinary symptoms on conventional hemodialysis, and excessive recovery time after conventional hemodialysis. So this is uh, basically maybe benefits of the patient to receive home dialysis. While contraindications are unstable medical conditions, like uncontrolled arrhythmia, scissors, suitable vascular access, unstable behavior problems, contraindication to anticoagulation, conditions that may cause abrupt loss of consciousness and severely visual impaired or blindness. So all are contraindicated. So not all high flux membrane are equal in performance. I think this is, for me, is an important graph because it's the roadmap of the dialysis strategy. On the left panel, you have the uh, molecular weight, and on the right panel, it's a correlation of the toxin diameter. So the toxin diameter determines which can pass through the pores of the dialysis membrane. And subsequently, if you increase the pores of the dialysis membrane, you have more albumin leak. So we have to compromise between both of them. We published the feeding coefficient difference in interleukin-1 receptor uh, uh, reduction ratio in high flux dialysis. We can find that there is a difference in between high flux and the reduction ratio. So it depends on the molecular, yes, but also depends on the porosity of the membrane and the feeding coefficient. If you look to this very big graph, it is in vitro studies between different dialyzers and dialysis membranes. On the right panel, you can find that the kappa and lambda interleukin-6 removal with different dialysis membranes. Sometimes you can find that it is zero or approaching 3.5. And sometimes you can find it's high. So it depends on the dialysis membrane. And if you are dealing with patients with COVID-19, you have to ensure that interleukin-6 are appropriately and extensively removed by both longer dialysis session and higher membrane porosity. So not all high flux dialysis membrane are equal and uh, could be used in the inflammatory uh, casket. So high flux has different civil coefficient, while medium cutoff and protein leaking and high cutoff dialysis membrane has higher albumin loss. So it is compromised between what to remove and what to retain, and particularly the albumin. So novel insight in theoremic toxicity over the last decades suggests that progressive and cumulative retention of products in the middle molecule weight range up to 45 and even 50,000 might subsequently contribute to enhanced cardiovascular morbidity. <laughs> Could 
question. Why we didn't find in the literature much more differences between different therapeutic challenges? Because much of the damage to the vascular system might be already being established at the moment the patient starts on renal replacement therapy, taking care of CKD, and this is groups of ceramic passes. To this value, it's removed by the kidney, but here is metabolized by other system. The albumin hemostasis in healthy individual and in the stage kidney disease is different. So albumin is inflammation related mainly in patients with CKD and the liver supports up to 10 gram per day. If you have an inflammation, you uh, touch the liver production or increasing its uh, uh, degradation. Albumin loss in the literature may reach even more than 20 to 30 grams per week, even with peritoneal dialysis or in hemodialysis. Part of them related to clearance from the dialyzer and part of them due to adsorption into the dialysis membrane. Why we need some albumin loss in dialysis? Because you remove the bad albumin, the glycosylated albumin, and induce renewal of the liver to produce more albumin. This state is very important. The albumin is subjected to irreversible post-transitional modification, oxidation glycosylation. So a stimulation of increased hepatic senses of functional unmodified albumin is one of the factors underlying the development and use of high-performance protein leaking membrane in Japan to remove the bad and to produce the new one. Hemodial filtration is my favorite. You can double toxins removed by the same dialysis membrane. You can use either pre-dilution or post-dilutional way. We discussed that uh, in more details in last session, but Increasing the uh, convection volume will increase the albumin loss. Again, it is not a bad thing to remove albumin because you remove the bad one. Even if you are using very intensified dialysis, most of the vitamins required are equally to the hemodialysis. So no fear of that increasing. In this literature, some of the uh, Vitamin C may be required if you intensify the dialysis. Reappraisal of hemodial filtration for your renal complication is recently published last two months that complex interplay between uramic toxin, fluid overload, and organ dysfunction in patients with kidney failure as compared with hemodialysis. Hemodial filtration lowers middle molecule weight uramic toxin more effectively than uh, high flux dialysis. In Japan, they induce pre-dilution online hemodial filtration and increasing the expanded zyuronic toxin needed to be removed, kappa and lambda light chains, and increasing in the use over the years. And in the Japanese data system registry, for this one from the 2009, increasing abruptly the use of hemodial filtration, online hemodial filtration. The prevalence is changing in the Middle East and Europe, considered to be one of the biggest areas for hemodial filtration. And again, it's increasing in number. The EMEA, Europe, and the Middle East area increasing in this uh, particular for hemodial filtration, for the online hemodial filtration over years. With increasing percent of the convection volume, it is the target, not doing only hemodial filtration. What is the target substitution volume should be achieved? And the optimal convection volume should be achieved to have the success and the benefit of hemodial filtration. Even in Europe and the Middle East, a little can reach the 23 liter in post-dilution. 
due to multifactorial effects. Clinical effect of chemodiaphyl filtration is a lot. Diarsal related amyloidosis, hypotension, intravenous hypotension, improvement of anemia, quality of life, restless leg syndrome, inflammation, either observational study, depending on the convection volume achieved and randomized controlled trial. So SDG FP23, as mentioned before, is 32 kilo Dalton and could be removed efficiently by online humidifier filtration. So the performance is changing if you are using the same dialyzer. If you are doing humidifier filtration, for example, free light chain, you can achieve higher clearance value and slightly album loss. What in the recent research in Anshamsa University is a potential benefit of using bigger surface area and the wider sub sieving coefficient of the arsenic membrane. Higher sieving coefficient giving a wider range of uremic toxin included. Lower albumin loss than in medium cutoff. Bigger surface area with higher clearance value, suitable for hemodial filtration, more consistent in performance by variable diarrhea membrane. Hemodial filtration can double the molecular weight removal than in high flux dials. So large dials of surface area and QF seems to be logic. And if you are seeing here, different sieving coefficients, you will have to choose the larger one with the high sieving coefficient. Our results. For the 2.6 high flux, the provisional results of, from our data is you can expand the uranic toxin removed from high flux to hemodial filtration. You can include kappa, light chain, alpha microglobulin, lambda, interleukin-6, and procalcitonin. So we can improve that by increasing the surface area and increasing the sieving coefficient. While albumin loss hourly, the first hour is the highest albumin loss, around one gram, in the strain to dilate. Followed by second and third hours, and fourth hour. So the total albumin loss in our 25 patients on this trial literature is 2.15 gram, which is accepted below three grams. And the transmembrane pressure is accepted as below 300 millimeter mercury by the end of the dial. We can achieve a higher beta 2 microglobin with hemodial filtration. We can remove tumor necrosis factor and asymmetric diamethyl RGE. All these studies are done in Enchamps University overviewing the hemodial filtration effect. So this is the uremic toxin could be removed and comparing the high flux by hemodial filtration. Also with Dr. Magda Sharawi, we did a very nice, I think it's one of the very nice papers we published is that the epigenetic changes and DNA methylation that have been improved with hemodial filtration. Interestingly, it is related as well to convection volume. So successful post-dilution or pre-dilution hemodial filtration should be met with improved in mortality from the top and the other. You can see that there's variables, substitution volume. So we cannot consider hemodial filtration as a universal success in all cancers. Even in the Gulf, differences between uh, countries like Bahrain, Dubai, uh, United Arab, Oman, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and still in their data, there is little who can achieve more than 20 liters in the post dilution way. So adequate prescription of high volume online hemodial filtration is surely should be identified for each session or per week. 
and large meta-analysis on conviction therapy have been published in the last few years taken together that these studies support the conclusion that high volume post dilution online is associated with improved overall access and the recommendation to obtain high volume post dilution should be toward vascular access and toward convection volume replacement with the recommendation the maximum possible although above 25 liters in post dilution is the same result so we can have around 25 liters per session in post dilution weight or 50 liters in pre dilution weight we can achieve the uh, that. a lot of the studies improving of the cardiovascular diseases with hemodial filtration cardiac and non cardiac infection related sudden death and other causes and the most important finding in all literature is the cardiovascular disease uh, improvement in patients with hemodial filtration it's very difficult to remove the protein pump by any techniques up till now and still awaiting a magic solution of bioartificial kidney. So to my colleagues and friends and professor, diuretic toxins identified are still in need for both quantification and their biological effects. In the media of uremia, the renal replacement therapy strategies should be pointed toward individualization of the therapy with an optimum removal of ceramic toxin using bigger surface area from data. Our research and the more dialysis style may improve the hemodial filtration convection volume with less membrane damage. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hashem. Uh, as usual, an excellent uh, illustration of ceramic toxins and its effect, uh, how it is produced uh the ways to remove it and the ways to avoid it and uh, you illustrated clearly uh that it's not just uh, toxins to the body but it, it affects the cardiovascular system the uh, gi system and even the progression of chronic kidney disease exactly. and the residual kidney function exactly it's very important to be mentioned and it's very important uh, to be discussed uh, I think we have a lot of uh, 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 questions. I, I have seen a question now from uh, my uh, dear friend, uh, again, uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid. Khalid Abu Zaid is one of my colleagues. Uh, we miss him in Egypt. He is working in Saudi Arabia in Jeddah. He is asking you, Professor Hisham, what is the best modality of dialysis for patients with ischemic heart disease? The current attacks of resistant refractory angina in an inappropriate patient. This is the first question. I will leave you to ask to, to answer, and then I will I'll get to the second question from Dr. Khaled. Dr. Hashem. Yes, it's a good question, and this is completely individualization. One of them is first we have to uh, find a way to improve the cardiovascular circulatory error. Because dialysis decreases the uh, coronary blood flow by 30%, and it's called myocardial stunning. And so if you have such that, you, you have to improve the dialysis prescription. If you allow me just for a second to put my laptop power. Okay, during this uh, time, I, I, I think, yes, uh, uh, there is... Uh, yes, yeah. I, 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 oh, he's back, okay. And second one is to improve the intradialytic hypotension. By improving that, I think one of the best approach controlling the anemia, controlling the electrolyte imbalance, controlling the coronary blood flow, and doing staple patients in... Uh, uh, Hemodial filtration, either post dilution or uh, uh, pre dilutional way. Yes, it is a holistic approach. It's not just one yes. approach, it's not just dialysis. You have to correct other factors. The exactly. second question, also from uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, is a plasmapheresis as a procedure reduce the uremic toxins? Plasmapheresis is not a, a prescription for the uremia because you remove a low at all. You, you remove immunoglobin, you, you remove all of them. 
plasma phase is a cut off is 2 million, very big molecule. We are dealing about below 50,000 uh, or 50 kilodalton. So plasma phases will, will remove, not only uranic toxin, will remove immunoglobulin, which is essential for the body. So plasma phases is not a way of therapy for uremia, unless it's uh, related to thrombotic pacer and geopathy or other uh, disorders. We can alternate plasma phases with hemodialysis as we do in um, Shams University. You also commented uh, on what you have said is that home dialysis uh, four hours for three times per week is not effective and it shouldn't be prescribed. Do you agree in this uh, uh, opinion? Home dialysis you have plenty of solutions. We have here as well in Egypt our experience is that. I think if you do home dialysis every other day, not three times per week, I will stress on that. We will not go to uh, every uh, uh, or three times per week because the, you will have a long day in between dials, the weekend of the, uh, free dials. So if you are doing three times per, uh, per week, you have to check to do every other day, number one. Number two, it can build up the hours you need according to personalization. You may not need more for hours, you may need six hours according if you have hyperphosphatemia or uremic manifestation or volume overload, you have to extend the hours. So would you advise nocturnal hemodialysis for home patients or uh, day hemodialysis? Most of patients, if they are not working and uh, stable and not on uremic state, can do daily, uh, day use hemodialysis. If they are working, like the Japanese and the patients needing to go to school or to job early morning and needs more dialysis uh, time, I, I advise you can do it on nocturnal piece. So what about protein uh, prescription in intensified dialysis? If the patient is doing five sessions per week, will you intensify or will you increase protein intake for him? I will intensify even if the patient is doing thrice per week. Okay. Not, not five per week. Protein is recommended for uh, patients on dialysis. And you know that we discussed that a lot, that never to restrict protein in patients on dialysis. So I also have a question about HDF and its role in other dynamic bonzies. And let me widen the question. What is the relation between HDF and MBD? It's not related directly to uh, adynamic pombogies. There is a common mistake that parathyroid hormone is only 9,000 in, in molecular weight and could be removed by dialysis. However, it's a very dynamic gland. Once it's the drop of the PTH, there is excess production. The only one that suppresses the PTH during dialysis is very high calcium. So in dialysis, so there is no way if you are using the ultra pure dialysate water and you are using the dialysis prescription, dialysate prescription, right? You are giving the right calcium dialysate, you will not have a dynamic bone disease. Surely you don't have aluminum. We don't see aluminum uh, uh, years ago. So let me ask you a question about uh, if you are going to start HDF, would you start it after many years of hemodialysis? or would you start from the beginning? Let me ask you this question in other way. Would HDF now correct uh, uh, the morbidities that happened during the uh, few years of hemodialysis before? It's a very good, uh, very good and very, you, you have a very in, uh, uh, intelligent question. You touch a very hot point. Who will have success and benefits of hemodialysis? Is the very long vintage on dialysis, like five years, 10 years, as previously described, or from the uh, uh, initiating dialysis, you start the hemodialysis. What has been deposited, you cannot remove. If you have, uh, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome, nothing will remove. You have to do surgery. So, to my opinion, I should offer 
hemodiapertrition. To any dialysis patient, if even they have a residual kidney function, because it's more stable hemodynamic and the residual kidney function potentially will be stable. So to my uh, side, it has the financial logistics, uh, all are uh, in the same uh, way. I can go to hemodial filtration for patients even who are starting dialysis. Uh, one last question for, uh, 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 about the relation uh, of HDF to pruritus. Yes, it's, uh, there is a study comparing the pruritus effect of hemodial filtration and its uh, uh, difference between medium cutoff. Both of them uh, improved, but not related to a specific toxin removal. That's why in the, my first talk, part of the talk is we, we are missing to identify which toxin related to pruritus, for example. Okay. And then let, a biomarker to remove. Let, let, let us listen to uh, the professors that are present with us, Dr. Said Khamis, Dr. Tariq Tamtawi, Dr. Bahazid. Uh, if they want to comment, I'll start by uh, Dr. Tariq. Would you like to comment? If you can. Uh, hello. Hello, Dr. sir. Good evening. Uh, really, it is an uh, updated uh, lectures. Uh, a lot of benefits. We got it uh, from Professor Isham said today in a good night. Uh, as regards the HDF, I am with you, Professor Hisham. I would like even to initiate for all if it's possible. And I think this is the right way for uh, better clearance and <coughs> better survival and less morbidity with this uh, diagram. Thank you, Professor Tari. Uh, as usual, you have the, the deep experiences and the shortest comment, but in the good. Thank you. Professor Said. Good evening, Professor Magdi, Professor Hisham, Professor Tara, and all the audience. Thank you, Professor Hisham, for this elegant presentation, as usual. Uh, if you allow me, I have three short questions. Number one, uh, as you know, usually our patient ask us in the dialysis unit to increase uh, the ultrafiltration, aiming to remove more toxins. Uh, and our, our answer, no, it will not remove toxins. My question to you, the more ultrafiltration between brackets uh, within the, lim the normal, lim uh, the, the proper limit can remove more toxin or I mean in another way, help in removing to some extent uh, uremic toxins, that's number one. Number two, uh, what about the, the research in the uh, area of the uh, protein bound uh, uremic toxins? I mean the splitter or the thing. Uh, it is progressing or not? And the third and last question regarding the dream of uh, selectivity in removing uh, uremic toxins. I mean, to remove the, the detrimental or the bad one and leave the good one. Uh, namely, for example, mm -hmm. I can remove the pro-inflammatory and uh, leave the anti-inflammatory cytokine, for example, Apart from the molecular weight size, I mean in another meaning like the electric discharge on the surface of the molecules or something like that. Thank you, Professor Risha. Thank you, Professor Said. Again, it's one coming, three questions coming from very, very uh, intelligent, uh, with hard experiences, very long experience, Professor Said Hamid in the field of dialysis. I will, I will start answering my first question, but uh, I will start by the third question, because I, I really uh, uh, need to re rethink about the first one, because I missed that. The third one, dialysis is blind. Stop. So you cannot discriminate between which is removed unless it's passed through the pores. What's next will be uh, probably selectivity, but up to now, uh, uh, no. Uh, your qu first question was, I missed. Please just give in, uh, me the uh, first question. Can have any role in, re in removal of the uremic toxins? I mean removal of water. Yes, uh, yes, yes. You, you mean that uh, if I remove much water, much fluid, it, it's increased in the clearance. The answer is yes, because the calculation of the clearance of any dialysis membrane 
depending on the diffusion and the convection. Yeah. Uh, and if you are removing much, much of the fluid, you remove much. And it's sometimes linear, for example, for the beta 2 microglobal. But this is the basic concept of uh, convection, uh, sort of in hemodial filtration. But if you are using low flux, what the patient will get benefit from higher uh, fluid removal? Nothing. If you are using high flux, it's already internal hemodial filtration and you, uh, substitution internally uh, about six to eight liters. So the, the patient asking is intelligent to some extent and giving the key for the hemodial filtration rule. For your second question, for the protein power dynamic toxin, yeah, I, I, I fully agree that we need more innovation in this field or this place. There's some research on that, but it's uh, uh, very little research on giving the patient pre-dialysis some of the displacers that can att uh, attach it to the alpha with more affinity than the protein parent toxin and giving that free. By the way, protein parent dynamic toxin, the very small solids, it's like uh, bigger than urea. And if you uh, displace from the alpha wind, uh, it should be removed easily. And it is you normally removed by the organic anion transporters of the renal tubules. So this laser is giving some insight, but very few literature on this field. Okay, thank you, dear prof. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Baha, uh, Zaid, if, uh, uh, if you want to comment. Professor Sharawi, Professor Hisham, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I was lucky enough to, I mean, last method, I heard Dr. Hisham before in uh, Dubai about uh, one week ago. And today was a nice presentation also. Thank you, Professor Hisham. Uh, but I want to ask you. two questions, please. Uh, one about is gender difference uh, in the response to the hemodialysis or hemodial filtration? Because I remember the hemo study showing a gender difference in favor of women in responding to mortality in patient with uh, using a high flux membrane. And another one about cognitive function. If there is any data about uremic toxins and improvement of cognitive function in patient on hemodialysis? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Professor. It's nice to see you this evening. I hope that you have a warm night. Uh, yes, there is some differences uh, if you are talking about the gender, but it's uh, for the KT over V because you are dealing with the uh, uh, just a small size. If you go to the hemodial filtration, the no difference between genders in the outcome between both of them, provided that the same rule, the same convection volume, the same frequency, the same duration. So it's not uh, the uh, difference. We can see that the women need more higher KT over V or uh, urea reduction issue. For the IMO study, uh, to my opinion, since the publication, it's completely biased study. And giving the word very fake names, for example, they are using uh, dialyzer with frequent reuse and uh, very pious in selection. So I don't depend on the uh, hemo study by any way. Uh, I, I only uh, swear that if you have a good science, it's meaning that you have a remic retention solid, you can find that what is the best uh, for uh, their removal. Uh, for your second question, please, uh, you can repeat that. About cognitive function and your yes, function. yes, I just uh, yeah, I I give one or two slides on this cognitive function improvement, and there is some literature on the uh, cognitive function. Again, hemodial filtration, there is some go with the improvement, some go without clinical improvement, and basically it depends on the substitution volume. If you are doing good substitution volume, you will have a benefit. Thank you, professor. Uh, much. Merry Christmas. Uh, I'd like also to, to stress on what uh, Professor Hisham said. It's not just uremic toxins. We should consider fluid overload as a uremic toxin. Sodium is a uremic toxin. Uh, and this should be considered in the dialysis prescription. I think it was clear from this presentation. Do you agree, Professor Hisham? Yes, and environmental factor. For example, the phosphorus. So nature is the monophosphate or diphosphate. And if you change the uh, environment of uh, the pH, for example, uh, metabolic acidosis, 
والاجريفيت ذا فوسفيت توكسيستي سو اتس مالتي مالتي فاكتوريال نوت اونلي ا سوليدس فور اكزامبل اف يو ار هاف ا اندوتوكسيميا هاي اندوتوكسيميا يو امبليفاينج اول ذا يوريك توكسيك سو اتس مايكرو انفيرومنتال كونديشن سوليدس صوديوم بوتاسيوم بايكربونيت اول اوف ذيم ار بلاينج ذا سيم جيم اول توجيذر So one last uh, question: uh, uh, How can you spread the use of HDF in Egypt? We are talking about high flux dialysis in Egypt since 15 years. We are calling for that, and and uh, the map is changed now. And the map exactly changed now to uh, more high flux with uh, l- lower uh, uh, doctors are uh, still using low flux. For hemodial filtration, we have to optimize the high flux dialysis first to be universal as, it, as prescribed in the guideline. And then we can do uh, uh, for patient hemodial filtration in a selected way. We have to put around 25% in our scope for patient with uh, hemodial filtration. Example, patient with comorbidity, intraretic hypotension, cardiomyopathy, polyneuropathy, diabetics, we can include first for hemodial filtration before universe. No country is universal hemodial filtration for all patients. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you have covered all the aspects of uh, uremic toxins updates and what can we do to remove them and prevent their production. It was a very lovely evening and I'd like to thank you, thank, uh, to thank Professor Riaser and all the attendants today and all the, those who shared with us this discussion. Uh, and until we meet uh, soon, uh, I wish you all uh, a lovely night. Thank you very much. Good night. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, having a warm night. Thank you very much. Yeah. Shukran. Shukran. Shukran.